Well, welcome back, ladies of Christ Presbyterian Church, and welcome to our friends who are also joining us as we study Proverbs this fall and journey down the path of wisdom. Well, for the last three years or so, I've been a part of the same connect group through the Christ Pres Music Row location. And while I was preparing for this talk, I received an email with our meeting plans for this coming Thursday. And I was, I was reading through that email, it hit me really what variety of work is represented and done across the city of Nashville just by the women in our group. Work which includes a real estate agent, banking, more than one grad student, a small business owner, an elementary teacher, a high school teacher, a school administrator, a lawyer, construction project manager, a university fundraiser, more than one nurse, a nurse practitioner, a writer, economist, sales manager, and of course, the never ending work of the mothers and grandmothers and aunts that are in our group. And again, this is just the women of our group. This doesn't include the work being done by our men. And I know that Christ Prez also has artists and volunteers and office workers and Uber drivers and restaurant workers and PhDs and MDs and the list goes on. The work represented at each of our congregations is as varied as the individuals who attend our congregations because all humans work. Which is why Proverbs wants us to grow in wisdom as it pertains to our work. Well, remember from our first few lessons that wisdom is skill in living well in God's world. Well, today we're going to focus in on growing the skill of working well in God's world. We're going to do that by looking at the dignity of our work, the difficulty of our work, and how ultimately wisdom helps guide the direction of our work. So if you'll pray with me and we'll dive right in. Lord, make us into women who delight in the work you have given us. Grow our love of your word and the role we get to have in the world that you created. Well, in the beginning, in Genesis 1-1, we are first introduced to God. And do you know what we find God doing there at the beginning of our Bibles? We find him working. God is first described as creating the heavens and the earth. And a few verses later, God is found creating the man and the woman, Adam and Eve. Starting in Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over all of the earth and everything that creeps on the earth. So God created them in his image. In his own image, he created him, them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over every living thing. After giving him their blessing, God called them both to do two things, to have babies and to work. When all was right in the world, when Adam and Eve, when they walked freely with God, before shame and toil and broken dreams and altered plans, before any of that had entered into the world, humans were made for and instructed to work. Our work has dignity because through it, we reflect our creator who also works. Or if you flip to the other side of your Bible and read the story of God's son, Jesus, there you will see that the whole of Jesus' earthly mission was doing the work of the Father. Jesus' work included teaching and healing, and of course, the redemption of God's people through his death and resurrection. But his work, part of his earthly mission, included the first 30 years of his life. In fact, the vast majority of Jesus' life was spent in Nazareth, a small village doing mundane carpentry work alongside family members. How much more dignity can the Bible give to ordinary work? You see the value or even the calling to do work, it's not defined by age or stage or education. For the people of God, work is our calling and it is our role in God's world. Well, in the spring of 1941, with Britain in the grips of war, author Dorothy Sayers, one of my favorites, gave a lecture entitled, Why Work? 
In that lecture, she stated that work should be looked upon not as a necessary drudgery to be undergone for the purpose of making money, but as a way of life in which the nature of man should find its proper exercise and delight and so fulfill itself to the glory of God. Work should, in fact, be thought of as a creative activity undertaken for the love of work itself. And that man, made in God's image, should make things as God makes things for the sake of doing well a thing that is well worth doing. Well, she goes on to say that work is not prim primarily a thing one does to live, but the thing one lives to do. It is, or should be, the full expression of the worker's faculties, the thing in which he finds spiritual, mental, and bodily satisfaction, the medium in which he offers himself to God. Our work has dignity because Work well done is one of the primary ways we worship and bring glory to God. Work is not just the way to fill our eight to five on Monday through Fridays. We weren't simply made for living for the weekend or a paycheck or to go through the motions. When we see work of devoid of value in God's world, when we undervalue our work, we strip it of its divine dignity and eternal value. Genesis tells us that God took delight in his work, and as his image bears, he desires for us to do the same. But what does this mean? What does it look like for, in our lives as we exercise wisdom in our work? First, you can honor God in all kinds of work. Over the last 15 to 20 years, the topic of faith and work has been widely written and discussed, um, but a simple summation is that all humanizing work is honoring to God. The work you do leading a Bible study or teaching a children's Sunday school, and the work you do designing a new logo for a client or restocking the shelves of Target or delivering groceries to someone who's homebound, all of those are examples of God honoring work. Proverbs 2.6 tells us that the Lord gives us wisdom, while Proverbs 3.19 through 20 tells us that by wisdom, the Lord created the earth, and by wisdom, he waters it. You see, God works both by caring for us and by tending this earth. There's no hierarchy between what's kind of called spiritual work. By that, I mean a missionary or working for a church or even a nonprofit. There's no greater value in that work than in what's sometimes called secular or non-religious work. Janitors, accountants, car mechanics, songwriters, and yes, ministers all serve and honor God because God is honored in all kinds of work. Second, sisters, it means you have the permission to live and enjoy ordinary, faithful lives. Martin Luther once said that God milks the cows through the hands of the milkmaid, meaning that all humanizing work deserves honor. The work you put into making meals for your family is honorable as it keeps them alive. Cleaning your home means health for you and anyone that you have in it. Running errands have value as it leads to provision or care of others or a stewardship of the things that the Lord has given you. Ordinary faithfulness in work has value and importance. Third, Christian work is simply work done well. I can guarantee you that Jesus did really good carpentry work. The tables or troughs or whatever he created were made for God's glory, and I'm sure that they were excellent. And using the list from my Connect group again, how are you to be a Christian grad student? You study, you go, to, you go to class, you get rest, and you do the best work that you can. How are you to be a Christian pharmacist or economist or real estate agent? You show up for work. You engage in ethical practice. <laughs> you make sure your numbers are correct, and you do work of integrity. Christian work is work done well. Whew, but y'all, <laughs> I've been in the workplace for over 20 years now. 
And I do know that all too well, the words that I'm saying are way easier to say than to put into practice and actually do. <laughs> See, God may be milking the cows through the hands of the milkmaid, <laughs> but the milkmaid, she gets muddy and she gets muck all over her. Cows have to be milked no matter the weather or the day of the week. The cows don't care if the milkmaid is sick or struggling with anxiety and depression, doesn't care if she didn't get any sleep last night, or even if she is totally over having to milk that darn cow one more time. Even though our work has dignity, we live in a broken world, and our work is frequently filled with frustrations and disappointments. Proverbs seems to know both the dignity of work and the difficulty of work. Do you remember back in one of our first lessons when I said that Proverbs, its original audience, and by that I mean the, the people that Solomon was directly writing to, that those were the youth of Israel, while Ecclesiastes and Job walk us through having wisdom in moments of frustration and disappointment. Well, Proverbs attempts, attempts to prepare us by trying to navigate us away from some of the actions and attitudes that can make our work challenging. And it does this by pointing out that work is often difficult because this world is filled with all kinds of injustice and dishonesty. Solomon wants us to avoid making mistakes, but he also knows we're gonna make some. So Proverbs also helps us know how to respond when we mess up, or when someone around us does. Its pages are filled with good habits for us to follow that honor the Lord. So as you read, you see that much of the teaching of Proverbs is encouragement towards faithful and God-honoring work. And it does this by discouraging waste and laziness and by encouraging integrity, just practice, and work that benefits the good of both the family and the community. Solomon, he wants us to have good habits that honor the Lord. So for example, Proverbs 10, 9 says that whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Solomon is coaching us to be honest and upright in our work and life because those who are not, they're gonna have to deal with the consequences of dishonest behavior. In Proverbs 11, 12 teaches, whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Proverbs warns us to speak with truth and kindness, both about and to our neighbors. And when we look at this through the lens of our work, neighbor can mean our coworker or our family members, and even the person to whom we're trying to make a sale at work. Solomon wants to show us that our words matter in our work. And Proverbs 18, 9 says, whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. Again, that was Proverbs 18, 9. Cutting corners in our work is not a good idea. I'm not talking about being efficient, which I love to do, but being devious. Many of us work in jobs <clears throat> that if we are slack, if we cut corners, there's real consequences. Children who might not learn what they need to, bridges that might crumble, undercooked chicken that might make people sick, or even a wrongly diagnosed or treated patient. Solomon understands that work is difficult, but he wants us to grow in our skill of navigating God's word well. But often the difficulty or to use Dorothy Sayers' word, the drudgery of our work, often it comes from a broken perspective of work. When our perspective gets broken or misaligned, well then, that's often when our work takes a wrong direction. And I'll be honest with you guys, writing this talk <clears throat> was really difficult. 2020 has brought with it international work disruptions, the, like of, the likes of which the majority of people living on the planet have never seen. For most of us right now, work is a minefield of new and ever-changing protocols, fears of downsizing or business closures, and of course, all the school uncertainties for teachers and parents and our dear students. And if we're honest, 
I think a lot of us would admit that 2020 has rocked our sense and understanding of work. And I'm not sure about you guys, but the last eight months, for me, my work has felt much more like difficulty than dignity. I need to be reminded of the purpose of work. And I'm so thankful that wisdom ultimately helps guide the direction of our work to the worship and honor of our great God. Teaching on this topic, my friend and pastor Ryan Anderson says that we were meant to work not to get an identity, but because we already have one. And seeing that, and that alone, is what will lead us to see the redemption of our work. God has de designed work to be dignifying and a way for all of us to flourish in his world, but he never intended for it to be our identity. And the, when, the rea when the reality of that truth gets misaligned or broken, that is when our work takes a wrong direction. When your reason for doing chores around the house is so that your roommate or spouse will like you more or that they might owe you something, you will find yourself disappointed <laughs> because at times they're not gonna even notice that you did the work. Or if you see your work mainly as a way of gaining power or wealth, at some point you will get to a place of dissatisfaction <laughs> the wise sage, Jim Carrey, he once pointed out in an interview, I think that everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see it's not the answer. When our work becomes our identity and that work is changed, like what's happened for most of us during this pandemic, or it's taken away, or it's just plain unfulfilling, when that happens, we're left feeling unfulfilled, bored, or lost. And that's because work was never designed to be our identity, but a faithful gift to the Lord. Well, the Apostle Paul, he wrote many letters to the early church as it began to expand outside of Jerusalem and the Jewish communities. And the letter written to the Colossians helps instruct the church then and now how to trust and apply God's truth in our daily lives. And reading from Colossians 3, 22 through 4, 1, Paul writes, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Sisters, whatever work you have to do today or this week, work heartily for the Lord, not to get an identity, but because you already have one. An identity that is tied to that hardworking carpenter, carpenter, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus who doesn't command you to do more or be more or have more, but who invites you to come just as you are to rest in him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. May each of us find rest in the gentleness of Christ, our true identity. If you'll pray with me. Lord Father, help each of us find dignity in our work this week. Grow and mold us into women who work for your honor as an act of worship. And Father, we come to you and we ask for rest when our work is difficult, knowing that you receive us with open and loving arms. Amen. Sisters, I hope that the work whatever it is that you have to do this week, that you are able to work heartily for the Lord, not to form your identity, but because you already have one. Thank you for joining me, and I look forward to our time together again next week.